You're talking to the mic. Uh, the, the talk show. Yes, yeah, turn, turn the mic in your direction. Yeah, okay. you go. Perfect. All right. So um, we're very excited and honored to have our uh, next guest today, and uh, his name is uh, Samad, and uh, he is, uh, as you know, well known in Philadelphia because he is such an amazing force in uh, in the community. In Philadelphia, he is, he is the, like, the owner of uh, one of the best African restaurants in Philadelphia, and named uh, Kings and Queens. So everyone, please give a warm welcome to Samet. And I also have my. Uh, uh, sorry. Sorry about that. Yes, I also have my partner here, Toby, and uh, so we just want to welcome you, Samet. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the Soup Talk Show. Appreciate it, man. Kicking out some pepper soup, I'm saying, I'm have to see over here. <laughs> Got a beef stock from my guy over there. Tasty, man. We here. How you guys feeling? We feel good. We're so happy to have you on the show, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, we know um, you have a lot going on, not only that. Second, um, you are literally so, like, trying to run a, a restaurant, but also, like, I also noticed that you took a recent trip back to the motherland. Um, so, can you share with us what this trip means to you and also like for the diasporas, the diasporas who live, um, who think about going back home, uh, what, you, what, what were some of the best takeaways that you want to share with us? Um, first and foremost, uh, I think some metal kind, it's from the Kings and Queens Library Cuisine. Uh, nice to meet you guys, I'm glad to be here. I would like to say, uh, you read the flyer. It says how to uh, create a successful restaurant. I want, I want, I, I definitely want to say successfully. I want to say it's fully successfully. I say probably how to create a restaurant on the way, on, on the way to, to success. Um, it's just the right thing. I'm just trying to implement every single day, revamping. So I definitely don't want. To, I'm not successful. I'm not a millionaire. I'm like that. I'm just striving and I'm, I'm learning every single day. As I uh, implement and learn, implement and learn, implement and learn. That's just my mm-hmm. strategy. And yeah, man, I, I, I just came from, I was in the synagogue first, and I was in Ghana first, and I went to Ghana second. Mm-hmm. But like the motherland, man, it's, it's immaculate. And so I came, so I was born in Liberia, just a little background. Mm-hmm. I was born in Liberia, I came over in like 96. So I haven't been to Africa in like over a decade. Uh, since I was young. So it was like a long overdue trip. So with that trip, I was able to kind of learn a couple things when it comes to family and things like that. So if some of you may have watched my, some first person may have watched my Instagram or my Snapchat, things like that. So again, I'm half Liberian and half Ghanaian. So my father's Ghanaian and my mother's Liberian. Um, but like my, my Ghanaian family, like it's much smaller than my Liberian family. Like we hold tribe and when it comes to my, my Liberian family. That's why like I kinda with the culture, uh, we have like two big families, the master play, the word big. So I, I can't even count my cousins. <laughs> but when it comes to my mom's side, what's up? But I went to go I know like I know a lot of about the Liberians growing up, um, more in depth. So I, I went to go kind of find out more culture when it comes to my dad's culture. Uh, when it comes to Ghana, we went down from Accra to the village, uh, San Berku. That's where my great-grandma, uh, that's where my current grandma is, but then my great-grandma and great-grandfather. So it was kind of, it was, it was amazing, man. It was touching and amazing. I was actually went out there with my uncle and my family members that was there. They all greeted me with joy. I mean. The way I mean, the way Africa is, 
Mm-hmm. Like once you come there, every, every single day, every single like, two hours, like, what you want to eat, what you want to eat. Yeah. And I, I think I even came to gain a couple pounds over there yeah. and everything. But I was able to basically kind of see my roots, roots when it came to my father's side. I literally went down to the one down to the village, say I'm saying, we're cool with the other four days. I was able to even see like pictures of my great great grandfather. And like I was able to see both the houses, my great great grandmother and my great great, like just both sides. And like where things started from. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at that. Let me see uh, where things started from. Mm-hmm. When, uh, when it comes to just my culture on my dad's side. And uh, also another blessing I wanted to see, especially with my grandma and there. Right now, because my grandma was in the States before too, for about eight, said about more than eight years or so, but she wanted to go back home. So uh, she could uh, spend her last days there and enjoy herself. So I, I actually wanted to like kind of put a smile on her face too so she could see me there because she always, when she was in the States, I got to come home, come see this, come see that, come see this. So everything that she always talked about coming kind of became reality. I didn't want to, I didn't want any of that to kind of vary without. Me, I had a possibility of bringing it to life, and, um, and it's kind of making that trip to Africa, which I uh, said so we all need to make uh, make that more of a custom vacation. So if you saw, like I said, if, if you, I'm, I'm doing like a little short documentary on it, so mm-hmm. you in there. But I went down when I was in Ghana. I was in Accra, which is like the uh, uh, it's like the capital of Ghana. Then um, after um, Accra. I kind of went to the village, which was like about an hour and a half out. I passed this camp called the Blue Brown Camp. So that's basically where a lot of librarians, they took refuge at the, the librarian war. I, I visited there. Um, I tried my best to aid a few people there, uh, blessing them, just to make sure like they were able to like, they were able to like kind of just be happy for that day with certain things that uh, was done out there. And just kind of, kind of seeing where I know a lot of my librarians, a lot of librarians do that. They kind of transit from America from this camp to the camp in the rest of life. Uh, the camp is actually still going on, but the camp is mixed now. You got librarians, Ghanaians there, Sierra Leone's, some people are mixed sure. I mean, you got mixed kids now when it comes to that. But um, it's, it's, still, it's, it's still pretty pretty tough. So uh, it's like heartbreaking seeing that. Um, just try to, to see people come from something or another. There's a lot, there's a lot of people in Philly, uh, Philadelphia or around or anywhere in the States that basically left that camp to come to America when it comes to certain things. So I definitely encourage go back there. Uh, don't forget about where you came from or the process and where you came from when it comes to transitioning from that camp to the United States. See what you can get back. See, I mean, like, just to see how you can put things together. So I did a little I can do nice and actually got more coming up when it comes to that. Um, but that's, that's that's about that. It's called I said it's called Blue Brown Camp. Um, check it out. And uh, after that I went I went to the village which was about twenty five minutes where uh, where uh, my family comes called Sam very cool. So that's like a kind of like a fisherman's town. It's like next to the next to the shore. It's usually known for like catching fish and et cetera. Um, and I was able to see, just kind of like bless my grandma and the tour of the place, just to see what was going on. Yeah. It, it felt like a, something that I could never, like the experience I could never ever replace. Yeah. You know, it's like a well to look for, yeah. overdue. Uh, thank you, Sam, for sharing uh, your experience. It sounded like it was such a humbling experience. Um, and sometimes that's okay, something that we forget. So uh, you, you have a very uh, beautiful, on strong background. And I love the fact that you're also like a uh, hybrid of like Liberia and Ghana. And I know there's always this uh, controversy and out there about your love rights. So I do want to ask you this. Not I'm going to show you man. I'm so, love rights. I'm not going to Okay, so we are. We are yeah, there's no controversy. Like, you sure it's not Nigerian love rights? Nah, Liberia's love rights. You sure it's not Ghana's love rights? The confusion does not come out. Okay, okay. Yeah. folks, you heard the man. So it's like we're in Jello Oh, wow. All right. How do you think your, your family, God and family will feel about this? Listen, I'm telling them. I'm telling them about Jello Fry. Right. Okay. All right. I'm telling them, like, we got strong, we got stronger aspects and other things. Yeah. But when it comes to that, when okay. cooking, we're leaving. All right. Liberia, Liberia is the soul food of Africa. What? Girl. 
I'm from, I'm from Guinea, so I'm, I'm going to stay neutral. <laughs> 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 um, but the, re the reason why I asked is because you know. I'm and not, originally, I mean, mm -hmm. like I said, my heritage goes really far. Mm -hmm. So even originally, originally, mm -hmm. like my family goes back to the beginning because like, they were my name. Oh, wow. So, yeah, okay. so if you take like my family heritage, my mom's mm -hmm. side, mm -hmm. and take it all the way back. So. Wow. That's so, uh, that's awesome. And the reason I why because you know we are known as one the love. We trying to bring the peace together. <laughs> so you know, at the end of the day, we're all Africans, right? Um, and that uh, we all try to really uh, bring everybody on the table so we can make changes, um, just like you're doing in the community right now. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pass on to uh, Toby uh, to just ask the next uh, questions. So just one thing to note um, that uh, on the uh, change of rules. Um, what exactly what inspiration to start uh, this kind of business? <laughs> Let's just take a deep breath in that. <laughs> take so, your time, man. <laughs> basically, when I was younger, I, we uh, went to the old soccer match and tried to change my life. After I kind of left uh, middle school, I was able to, we were the first graduate of. Uh, First full graduating class of Master Charter. Mm -hmm. So Master Charter kind of gave me that internship presence in life. Like our classes was kind of set up like our, our college was. We had different courses, mm -hmm. um, different breakdown. I had an internship at Jefferson. So long story short, on Wednesdays we had half a day. We were the only school that had half a day on Wednesdays at Master Charter at the time. Mm -hmm. So on Wednesdays, it all start off. I call everybody to my house. Parents would be at school. I mean, my parents would be at work. But you wasn't cool. Yeah. You know? <laughs> no, no, I wasn't cool kid at all. I wasn't cool kid at all. But like, I, I would just, I mean, I'll call some people over. We come over. We we chill. We eat. I find something. So then it kind of became bigger than that after that. So I just kind of like to create my own vibe and kind of introduce people to certain things. So like, when people come to the house, they see certain things. Uh, yo, what is that? Like, what's that? Like, what well, is that? So, like, it was different things. I'm mm -hmm. like, I know this food is good. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. So, I was like, I know this food is good. And it's like, they gotta try it. So, one or two people tried it. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, um, it kind of moved from that to me where we straight in my cookout. So, I used to have the craziest cookout in Southwest. So, I'm from Southwest Philly. So, shout out to Southwest Philly Raiders. You feel me? So, I used to throw these cookouts, basically. I would bring food, the music, the drinks, and just bring a whole vibe. Mm -hmm. So I tell my I tell my parents, hey, I'm having um, just a little get together with a couple friends. Then I um, but I started, I kind of like started my, uh, I cook, if people don't know, but I don't really, that's, when I present myself, I don't present myself to cook. I present myself as a business man. So that, uh, we're going to talk to that, like how I graduated when it comes to just, um, because I'm a foodie in general, mm -hmm. but that's how I kind of know what good food is and what I know, I kind of know some level the taste that the majority of people, they like or want. So with the food, I would get up like three grills at that time. When I started Caribbean culture when I first started like getting in the kitchen and things like that. So uh, I'll do the jerk chicken. I do like the fried rice, the jello rice, mm -hmm. I had to order. So the people come to the cookout. When I say my parents come home, the whole block, about 100 to 200 people, they came out as I was doing a promotion online. Like 100 to 200 people came out. Just the music, the food, the vibes. So I fed the whole, I mean like multiple cookouts, I fed the whole block. Everybody got a piece of jerk chicken, a piece of rice. And they was like happy. I saw, I saw how happy people was. It was just with the vibe, the culture, uh, and it's like it's something new that they never had. Mm -hmm. At that time, they didn't have the chicken. They either they didn't have the chicken or the type of rice it was. And they always always ask, "Yo, what was that? What was this? What was that?" And like I somehow had some kara. I had some like puff puff, aka kara. Um, so with that, I was kind of like I saw the power of just bringing people together. I'm like I had events, events. I spent like thousands and thousands of dollars. Well, that's what I was wondering. I was like, you out here feeding the whole block? I'm like, I'm saying like, I'm just saying like within like okay, well, with, with the 
the chicken with the quarter legs and the rice. Mm -hmm. So you know, rice sometimes is better. You know, like with the labor, really the labor yeah. that's the time in it. Mm -hmm. And then like, and also like just kind of putting it, putting with the quarter legs. I'll do that. Man. It would feel like the at the time like cheapest I could buy the mm -hmm. wings and things like that. So I, I was still in the budget. I was still budgeting, but when I, where I spent thousands, thousands of dollars, I basically had events after events. I had parties, events, and I saw like what could really bring. I saw what the food, the music, the culture. Um, and just introducing people to the culture through the food and the music and stuff. Like, you know I came out of college, shout out to Penn State, graduated from Penn State, PSU we are. Um, so I came out of Penn State and I said, you know what? I went, actually went to Penn State for reality. I was almost, I was, I was almost like done with reality. I had like two mm -hmm. years in, I had a going on three. Then I had a motorcycle accident, a real bad one. Mm -hmm. Tripped over. Gash, everything. I sat in, I sat in. I've I, I always been busy. Always been busy. My music tells us I've always been busy my whole life. Mm -hmm. I sat in the hospital literally for like a week. I, I don't like to sit, sit down too long. <laughs> and I, I get anxious. So I said, you know what? I, I don't think I really want to do reality anymore. Let me put my fears aside. Let me do business and see what I can do when I get out. So I got out, I got out of Penn State. I said, I eventually wanted to do reality to get in the hospital to help people. Because my whole thing was to help people in a certain way. Like, Maybe there's another way I can help people and bring them joy besides being in the hospital or just the whole side of stuff. I say, somebody if I could just like, because sometimes you drop in, you uh, saying so many great things, told me like, sometimes I want to pause you just for you to like dissect mm -hmm. a little bit about all the gem that you dropped in right now or elaborate more on that. So, you know, coming from an African culture, I think sometimes we can all relate to this about like there's this expected career already like out there lined up for you. And sometimes your parents want you to do this, like, you know, you want to help people. It's either like, you know, the route is doctor, the route is like become any like, you know, specialized professional. But Nate, you just mentioned this, you know, you had this accident. And then you had this moment of epiphany, right? Um, but then you talk about fear. Like letting go of this fear as you think about like switching careers to follow your passion. Talk to us about like that moment, that experience. Right. Like how did you process that fear to finally come to that decision? So it was like I could have died on a motorcycle. Um, I literally like my motorcycle was like total. I crashed into a wall. The motorcycle went first. Mm -hmm. I went after. I mean, this is not my first life and death experience. Or, like, mm -hmm. my, my life been crazy. Mm -hmm. But, um, so I just kind of had it fit me. I just wanted, I'm like, you know what? Like, life is just too short. I just need, I, I need to kind of get things together. Mm -hmm. It's like, I got to do what I want to do in a certain way and still kind of figure a way out. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I, was, I, re I didn't realize an entrepreneur at the time I was doing what I was doing when it came to a lot of events planning and, um, Put me together. I didn't realize none of that. I just did it because it was in me. It was just kind of like a hustle. So, with that, I was able to say, well, I'm not going to think about what nobody else is say. I'm going I'm to I'm run with my plan and I'm going to see who can follow when it comes to that. So, that's why I was like, you know what? I want to introduce people to culture, to library culture. So, I kind of put things into play when it comes to, I think it was like in November, believe it or not, it was in November that I decided I really, like I literally decided I wanted to do a restaurant. And yeah, think about me, what like, year was that? November? November, I think 2013. Okay. So we about seven years in with the restaurant right now, mm -hmm. believe it or not. Like, that sounds, it sounds mm -hmm. about so fast. I mean, the like, restaurant is still young, but where it is right now. Yeah. I mean, but talk to us about that. Like, like, so, 2013. So, it's 2013 November, and I said, I put my mind to it. Because with me, like, my, my advice to, like, some of my mentees is that when you want to do something, don't think about where the money is at. Don't think about you not having the money. Don't think about, like, like you overstressing yourself. Just get the plan. I literally, everything I do, I really start to do it. <laughs> And then I'll figure the money out later on. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you how I kind of like do parties back in the day, right? I would hit my uncle up. I would, I would go, I, I would like finish like plan everything, get the flyers done. And I put myself at the pressure point. Mm -hmm. So I hit one of my uncles up. I'm like, hey, mom. Um, this one I was like charging for the party. Like, oh, okay, give me four hundred dollars or two hundred dollars. I promise you, I'll bring you back like four fifty, four five hundred. So I build that credibility with my uncle. He would give me money. Uh, I mean, like it wasn't it wasn't 
easy, but like, I kind of had that, I mean, you got to build that trust with whoever you're dealing with. You're giving money, even if sometimes if I take the loss, I wouldn't get no money out of my pocket. I would, I would keep no money, but I will make sure that I pay them, so the next time I'm going there, you'll get it again. Because that just go back, like, sometimes you got to put yourself against the wall and start something. It's better to start something and leave the rough draft there instead of to have a blank sheet of paper. So if you see, you ever see like you starting a note on like like a uh, note on your phone, and you're like, oh, you need to draft it or not? At least you got something to go back to, and then you know what point you at. So that's basically like how I live my life with things. Like I try to make a rough draft or whatever it is, and I just kind of move on to what I might um, slip back and like and come back to it later on. So with the restaurant, it was like I remember I said, you know what, I'm gonna do a restaurant. Like how am I gonna? Never, never in my life. I didn't have no. I only had one aunt that one restaurant shop to buy food restaurant. Uh, my aunt, she she had a restaurant Southwest. She was she was she was killing it. She started from a house, then she went to a restaurant herself, and then my even when she got to that restaurant, they hit her hard like with citations, with this, with that, not because of the food per se, but because of the structure. Yeah. So I kind of seen one or two things with structure when I had to. Like we had um, fire safety, health, mm -hmm. health inspection. Like I seen one or two things. I didn't have nothing mapped down though. Like, I didn't write it down. I didn't know that you needed a safe serve, that one figure, you needed this and that. So I said, you know what, I remember I went over this time, I was like, what am I gonna over I need somewhere, um, well, I can't get a big store. I can't get a real big store because the budget ain't there. Mm -hmm. But you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna start, I don't wanna stop in the house. There's no problem starting from the hospital, trust me. Like, it's no problem. It's just that I kind of had a vision and I had a, um, and I wasn't waiting. I had a goal plan already. Working with money I saved up from college, et cetera. So I was like, you know what? Let me find a location. So we on Floyd Mac and Willard now. We driving. So I see a location that's been dead for like a while. Mm -hmm. So I'm a strong believer in, in like myself and um, just. You can turn any situation into a, any negative situation into a positive situation. Right. And that's that's what came with that location. That location wasn't open for almost like ten years. Right. They just say in life, you know, where there's poverty, there's an opportunity. You know, where there's a struggle, there's an opportunity. There's a struggle where there's an opportunity. So I kinda I, I seen that so for that what and I'm like, listen, location is definitely key. That's one. But um, we don't feel like wooden. Three, four, five, five, ten. We got an emergency city. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and if you see now, they coming more and more up. So I'm like, why is this? I'm like, now, okay, yeah, some violence around here, one thing going around here, but I kind of still saw opportunity in that. So basically, it was in November. I got the building. And I asked my mom. I, 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 I didn't really, honestly, the restaurant thing. I didn't want to go full throttle at all. I just really wanted like a little bit of investment. I, didn't, I, I really didn't want like to put all my money into it. It was another. I always started up projects because um, the little background, just the, the slight background, you know, throwing parties. I became a DJ. I became a bartender. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I became a server. Mm -hmm. I was a cook. Right. And literally, I played like almost like every single game with throwing those parties. Mm -hmm. So it was like it was just starting up another project. I'm like, but this project will be different. So I call all my aunts and my like, hey, y'all wanna um, let's start a restaurant. So this one I had a high budget, I'm like, I'm like, about like 50, 60 K. This is like, this is gonna be like plan work, you know? I'm like, ah, let's start so I call them there, ah uh, let's, let's just start at the house, let's start at the house, let's start at the house. I'm like, I can't do the house. It's like seven. It's like seven of them. of them. It's for like ten thousand rent or like five thousand each. Or and it, let's, let's just get some money. So everybody told me no, besides two people. So it was my mother and my aunt. My mother and my aunt. Everybody told me no. So mm -hmm. they, I mean, like, so I took the two people. Mm -hmm. They were one of the rock with me. So I took those two people. Um, they followed my lead. Uh, I said it was November. I literally got the place in December. I got the place in December. Uh, I had, um, after I got the place in December, I got the keys. I 
started just, I went in there, started cleaning up from what it was before. I did little I could do before anything else, you know, before I could follow my going out to the, go out to the administration, but you, you, you need a lease before you can start anything, basically. That's how we start a business sometimes, you gotta kinda have, you not kinda gotta have a plan and structure of what you're gonna do within the first two months of getting that building together or the first month or so. Or just kind of have a plan of action. So I kind of got into that plan of action. So I, I grabbed um, um, one, one of my good friends, E. So me and E, when I, I grabbed E, I'm like, oh, E, how do you build construction or you build whatever it is? We clean out the whole place. Like, literally, like, that whole, I wasted no time. So I got a key, clean out the place, make sure everything was good. I started thinking about where to paint this, where to do this, where to do that. And just, it just kind of like, I knew the resources I had at that time, and so I had to like sit with paperwork or kind of figure it out, uh, go through the hassles of like bumping heads with uh, some officials downtown. Like, it ain't, I mean, Philly's a rough city, so, <laughs> Jasmine, you know, it ain't easy when you get down to City Hall. Like, you gotta have a tough skin. Believe y'all, I'm telling you. Yeah. When you get down to City Hall, you gotta have a tough skin. Yes. If you don't have a tough skin, when you get down to City Hall, it ain't gonna make you cry. Right. It don't make you feel like you just need to go home <laughs> and just like don't do whatever the hell you need to do. Like, yeah, I you mean, gotta have a tough skin. Right. To get I mean, I see, it also takes a, a little bit of uh, kindness and respect too, because I do yeah. feel that sometimes the way you approach those folks at yeah. City Hall determines, you know, how they will respond to you. So it'd be a little nice to them. My advice to you is please be respectful and, and kind and nice, and trust me, you get the help that you need. Right. <laughs> but if you come out with an attitude, you will get served. Definitely have respect. Right. Have, have respect. And like yeah. I said, have that tough skin. The reason I say have that tough skin mm -hmm. is because they may hit you with an attitude. Yes. They may think, like, what did I do wrong? Or you didn't do nothing wrong. It's just that you're dealing with so many personalities. Yeah. That's why you're in the restaurant business, you gotta understand. You gotta have a tough skin too. Because you're dealing with a lot of emotional personalities. When you're dealing with anything public, mm -hmm. you gotta have a tough skin and don't take anything personal. Yeah. Because that person's day is going to reflect on you, depending on your service and what you provide them. So, basically, now we're in, now we're in like November, December. Then we open a restaurant like February ish, February, March ish. That's when we opened it. Um, we started from a window, um, serving out the window. Um, I put it at work now. from 11 a, um, from um, 6 a.m. All the way to like 11 p.m. I, I would build my structures. I would open seven days a week. I didn't know what that seven days a week was going to do to me. I had to go Jetro to go shopping. I had to get the food things in order. Um, and I had to do every, all over again seven days a week. Because I wanted to open seven days a week. I wanted to make myself available and things like that. Literally, I come out selling like all food. I fall asleep right on the floor when I get in the house. Mm -hmm. Like, it was crazy. We were talking about, like, making, like, one, two hundred dollars a day. That's the only number we get. But just making, like, one, two hundred dollars a day, just pushing from the window. So basically, um, I did everything hands on, very much hands on. You know, introducing people to the culture, when it comes to, hey, try this. Like, I was not ashamed. When it came to just getting out there, selling myself, selling the product, because I believe in this one thing I believe in, I believe in African cuisine, Liberian cuisine the most when it comes to that. So I believe the the taste, the cold, I mean, the taste, the, the culture cooking, um, and it's just like everybody had a restaurant. A lot of people had restaurants. Like there was restaurants when I was growing up, it was about five, six rooms. So it's like, what made me different? Yeah. So. That's the approach I had to make it. So I'm like, what did not like? Customer service was number one. What can I do different? So I knew that was number one. So I knew that a lot of people like that customer service. So I wanted to get good customer service, good experience, so people can understand and be and feel comfortable with like tasting the culture when it comes to the Liberian cuisine, African cuisine, however. So. I know with doing that, you gotta be very delicate because you're, you're, you're in somebody else's territory. Where they got soul food, you see how the Chinese came, 
uh, Asian cuisine, Caribbean, like where in the uh, where in the where where their belly was mm-hmm. basically. I'm not their belly was like soul food, however it is, or even Asian cuisine when it comes to that. And I saw that the Jamaican cuisine can kind of break through mm-hmm. the American culture, African American culture, however it is. I'm like, we got it. We just we just, we just gotta put things together right. the right way. Right. Like, and that's one thing I think people uh, kind of express is that we have to twist and turn things the best way we can in order to introduce people to culture. At first, it was frowned upon with different things, like literally, like uh, this. And not like when people think about African food, you think about oh, spicy, spicy. It really isn't spicy. Mm-hmm. It just depends on your household. It depends on your family. like at certain dishes. That's that's just gonna be spicy because you know that. But it also depends on your household too, and because not everybody's gonna uh, and like react. So not everybody's gonna be peanut butter. Not everybody's gonna be able to react to um, a certain spice. So it's like you gotta kind of switch things around. So one of my biggest thing was on, on some some on some aspects I'll take a pepper and put it on the side of the food. It cost me a lot more money. Mind you, we do we do we sell like almost. Five hundred or a thousand, a thousand peppers a day. Yeah. That's like a thousand little peppers that yeah. gotta go out, bagged and tagged, bagged and tagged. Yeah, it just sounds like to me that you were just doing the small things that you know, like a lot of people overlook. Um, but I want to actually want you to maybe talk a little bit about customer service, right? And I personally, like all of us, and I, I, I want to make sure, like you know, connect to the uh, audience here too. You know, some of us really had not a good customer service experience with African restaurant. I'm just gonna be honest. And um, so I'm glad that you actually brought that up. And I could also, I could tell right now why that is a reflection of where your restaurant, what Kings and Queens are, is right now. So talk to us about what customer service. I know I'm not just gonna focus on like African restaurant, but since we are talking about African food right here, African restaurant, and I, I personally had a bad experience with the customer service there, why is customer service so important? Especially for African restaurants or like any of these restaurants that are driven by like culture. It's very important. I actually, I've been disrespected one or two times when it mm-hmm. comes to, not, I'm not gonna say African restaurant, but when it came to like just a restaurant while I walk in and it's like, um, I ordered this. Well, trying to follow the people order this. Mm-hmm. Do you know my name? Mm-hmm. To match my name to the order? For you to tell me was not there or what did you order? So like you have to leave some type of structure when it comes to that because I know everybody works hard, no man, no man. They be, it can be, it can be their last dollar of the week, but they want to make themselves happy. Mm-hmm. They want to spend that money with you. So you can't really measure that. To say if somebody lasts or somebody that's involved, it's not a good job to measure that. So you treat everybody accordingly. But you don't know, you never know what sensitive point you're touching. So customer service has always been key to me. Because like I enjoy like going out to different upscale restaurants and getting that customer service approval kind of for, for what I pay for. Like so I'm a foodie. So like I go out to eat, so I know how I want to be treated. So I try to my best to reflect that with the low budget I have. Cause it's expensive too. Don't forget, customer service can be expensive on a business end. Just to have somebody to agree to someone, or because sometimes you can't on a, on a small business you can't really stretch your hands. So I get it. I get it from a small business point of view, but it's kind of like an investment that will come back to you once you sacrifice that. So that's like. My biggest advice, because I know, I know, like we may not have the budget to hire two, three people to do individual jobs, so it becomes very stressful when you're trying to get from somewhere, mm-hmm. from nothing to something, and like to the top. Mm-hmm. So, but you gotta figure out where you want to be. Do you want to be down here and just drag it for the rest, like the next thirty years, mm-hmm. or do you want to be great? Mm-hmm. And in life, I say, either, especially when it comes to business, either you want to 
So Matt, thank you so much uh, for being just vulnerable with us and just keeping it real on the show. Uh, it's really amazing to just continue to hear your experience and story. Uh, Toby, do you uh, have any uh, more yeah, questions? Just really quick. So I'm just going to take a couple steps back because mm -hmm. I think there's a crucial point that you made, but we didn't fully realize. You touched on it a little bit. So one thing you said was you, you know you were always busy, but when you had the you know the accident was a moment of reflection, you know, pause, and you slow down a bit. Um, through your story, like you were always living your your purpose, but fear didn't allow you to realize that was your purpose. Then once you realized it, that's when you went full throttle. So I think that's a lot of experience, you know, just for our audience. You know, everyone else looking for something to do or their purpose, because sometimes it's always right in front of you. And just moving that fear helps you to like go full scale. So for that point in time, have you seen a difference in like how you approach your situations or mm -hmm. the kind of plans you executed? Do you feel like you dream bigger, you did bigger things or based on the story you do, but like how how did it help you the trajectory trajectory? Of what I mean, which is <laughs> <laughs> of how you want to be your future to be. Alright, so we kind of touched like, like three topics in there. First, I'm going to start with fear. Um, fear, it, it's cool. It's cool to be nervous. It's cool to like, to basically like not know or not know what's on the other side of the door when it comes to certain things. But again, that's what it is. Got more life to live. So would you rather be stagnant and like not look for that result so you can learn from it? Or would you rather be stagnant and never know what's behind that? See yeah. yourself? Why a lot of us sometimes get you back to the act like you're almost on that side of the door. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when it comes to that, it's like you, you gotta you never know how that grass may grow. It may get bad, it may grow for uh, flourish. So like you really have to take that step. So even even today, I like actually use those tactics when it comes to content, when it comes to um, innovation. I have to use those same tactics of okay, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna put the steps up. See what it is and learn from it and get the next one. So I move very swiftly and fast. Like these days when it comes to just. Trying like to, to 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 process and think about it, but then to also move fast on it or move in general on it. So that, that's kind of like the thing when it comes to just fear. And then um, what was it? Um. So once you're able to remove that fear, that helps project you into what you're doing in your future or the restaurant you need. Yeah. So like, and then also envisioning, you have to. Kind of see past what the what your norm is, and kind of see that your norm is kind of like is never ending, mm -hmm. never ending in the sense that it's not always going to be like that. Yeah. You have to kind of give it a chance and let it play out and kind of learn and move on from it, mm -hmm. and just kind of add it in. Uh, Sam. And so that was an amazing question because it really uh, focused on what's going on currently right now uh, with the with the emergence of COVID. And COVID has actually devastated the restaurant industry. Um, and and I just want to um, hear more about you know, but I can also tell like your mindset based on your personal uh, experience how you could sort of like continue to. Uh, Thrive in these difficult moments, but with the emergence of COVID, I would say thrive. I would say thrive. I would say survival. So we want survival. Like, well, can you talk to us about how uh, Kings and Queen right now is actually navigating these difficult times, especially when COVID has like really devastated the uh, restaurant industry? Like, you know, how do you navigate this uh, hard time right now as a business, as a black business owner? See, the black business owner and the small business owner, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, these times, we won't get the little bit of traffic. We won't get the uh, traffic that we have for us on the weekends and dining and up and down. So we, we lose all of that. Now we're down to take off. So luckily, I was like a first African restaurant here on Grubhub when they first went on our first location. And um, even um, Uber Eats, when the first African restaurant. So I, I learned how to adapt a little back then when it came to kind of trusting the 
system of delivery through these third parties because I know as much money as I want to save, I want to reach people. So it's like a lot of people, they they try to stay away from adapting to those third parties without kind of seeing what they can do on their point to make it a better relationship with third parties. And they don't see that a system, must, one of my main things is like building a system, a system that works. So a system that works will never let you down. You're able, you'll be able to go back and check on that system and know what part it plays or how it, how, how it plays in your life. So that's like one of the biggest things that kind of worked this uh, this whole pandemic is having a system. Mm-hmm. And just kind of changing things up from the norm, mm-hmm. switching it up, and just kind of still having high faith, um, marketing, and just like figuring out new ways to get people out. Mm-hmm. Like we had like a Kings and Queens deal, but we understand people were hurting too. Um, we also did some give backs. Um, we fed the less fortunate, um, we did some other things beyond the scenes, and like, we were, um, that's just one thing about me, so I'm very much of a social entrepreneur, that um, I try to give back to the community as best as possible, but just kind of working through that, even when we don't, when we did have, when we do have, and just counting your blessings and making sure they come back, they don't come back. Yeah, that's powerful, that's great. You say you're like a social inter- entrepreneur, um, so I, you know, we look through your social media, sometimes we see some of these, like, you know, uh, uh, famous uh, artists uh, come through the restaurants and stuff like that. So talk to us about that. Like, you know, why do you think it's important sometimes to bring these stars uh, and come and meet at your restaurant? What are you trying to do with that? Like, you know, what what are they walk away with that? So, man, honestly, like when you see like artists or some artists, some Afrobeat artists mm-hmm. or some like. Um, some American artists, however, this may come to it. It's it started from a certain point where it's like just presentation. It's like if my place is a hole in the wall or the customer service wasn't there, and somebody couldn't like you couldn't recommend it to the next person because you never know who is listening or you never know who can speak up for you. That's why I say customer service is key. So if that person had a bad experience somewhere and they go mention you in the room. An example. I uh, knew this girl, she models. And one of her instructors, she came to yeah, Kings and Queens. We took very good care of her. I uh, gave her introduction to my brand cuisine. Then the girl that models, she called me. She's like, yo, um, this person that's like she admired was so like, they had my brand cuisine. They had some meal plates. They're like, I'm like, thank you, whatever it is. And she's like, blah, blah, blah. But Things like that, that's what you gotta remember, business ethics. Because another reason why I flow with the culture of West African food is because it opens topics mm. in rooms. So it's like going for a job interview, oh, you went to Penn State, oh, you went to this. So if somebody had a good experience with our bread cuisine, or West African cuisine in general, they're gonna be feeling happy to talk to the next West African. They open topics, and topics open room for growth yeah. within any industry. Right. It could be engineering, it could be medical, it could be anything. Mm-hmm. So, like you, you have to be careful with like how you kind of do your business ethics and how you go about things. Mm-hmm. You have to be very careful. Because you never know who may come back later on and bite you mm-hmm. or may help you grow. So when it comes to artists, like, like they come in town, they ask, like, oh, what's the best respectable place to go? The travel is after culture, or if they haven't tried this, might recommend this one. And things just kind of start falling in place, falling in place. And after a while, it's just like, I get a phone call, hey, yo, this person in town, they want to try to I get a phone call, so I, I get phone calls, I mean, like, somebody called me, like, yo, Bird boy on some food. Oh, yo, uh, oh, so yeah, bird boy, bird boy came through. I mean, I, we want to know, like, we want some of the <laughs> artists that have came through the restaurant, you know. I know you're trying to go home, but come on now. <laughs> so we know, I follow you. You can only say that, I will. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, it's like I said, like, um, I mean, just like I said, I don't really count, but just some, like, some main artists we, we did, I mean, like, with some connections, we did some stuff, Fabulous, Little mm-hmm. Baby, uh, Burning Boy. Uh, Chima Day, Malik Berry came through. Um, a lot of local artists. Um, my man, um, sh- shout out to my man. Uh, recently, before the pan- 
folks. Uh, Jay Stone came through. They came all down from Cali. They came. They blessed us. They, we had a good vibe right, right before the Corona went out. But it's like, it's a beautiful thing, man. Like, when I know that no matter who it is, I can introduce them to the West African culture. They're able to take something away and say, yo, I had this. I had this. It was great. Um, and I want more. And it's like, they looking for the love. Uh, That's dope. So quick question, um, what do you believe, you know, you know, added to the success of the, the spread of um, the restaurant? What do you think was the catalyst to, to make it not just be, you know, popular in the African community, but, you know, the larger demographic at all? Because our, um, our model is like, life is too short for average food. And um, when you see the new e-culture, you feel me? It's a new story brand. So when we see e culture, no skin between, and we here. <laughs> so it was kind of branding and um, letting people know that it's safe. Even though we know it's safe, it's like when you go to the Dominican Republic or you go to South Korea, uh, South Korea that's your first time having a culture food. Mm-hmm. So you want, you want, like when you go to uh, an Asian store, like you may not know everything on the menu sometimes, you know, you fried chicken wings and but sometimes you explore out of the name of culture. So that's good. So you want to make sure that the awareness is there and also that people know, like, okay, this is the best way you can have it, or however it is, you're able to kind of let them know, like, hey, this is comfort food. So that's what kind of like took us to the next level is that I was on that corner of 49th and Woodland. I walk up to the trolley stop with a little spoon and a cup. Cover it up, however it is, free sample, free sample, free sample. I get off so many free samples. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was not ashamed. I was like, I was very proud and I believed in it. You feel me? I believed in the transition of them trying new cuisine and life. And like, I mean, it was, um, damn. Um, this, um, this, this is heavy, but there's this one kid, um, his name was Jay, uh, rest in peace, somebody got buried today, I don't know, I forget how he passed away, but this kid would come to the window, like, we want you to do so many people, you feel me? I just want to come, come to the window and just kind of try, even if it's not, even if they, if they are librarian, come and try and librarian, have our librarian cuisine, or our West African cuisine, when it comes to that, I mean, Asians, um, Caucasians, um, like, is, is a, we have a very much diverse audience. I mean, older people, uh, younger people. Um, I remember I, this is one, uh, one lady, she used to come from work every single four nights and one every single night, probably like around like eight. So I'll see her come up the trolley, I saw my employee go, I'll walk, I go help her, but I'll bring her stuff closer. Or when her, like, or she'll, she'll probably come in and her, her niece or her nephew come pick her up at the bus stop. Mm-hmm. So I see her one day. I see her like two, two, three days in a row. I see her, I see her waiting for her ride. I took the opportunity. I went over there. I'm like, hey, how you doing? My name. This is what we're doing over here. Across, this is what we're doing over here across the street. Um, try this. And like from that day when she tried it, and then like also the kind gesture of when her, when her ride come, I open the door, uh, help her get the things inside. So like. I didn't do it to feel like, I didn't do it to get to receive something. It was just like kind of my kind act and what comes with the service. Mm-hmm. When it comes, I want to let them know, like, hey, we are loving people. Mm-hmm. Like, I want you to understand that. I mean, like, this food comes with a loving culture that we make either back home, all eat together, mm-hmm. all eat into our all, like, we have to soup talk, like, we'll have good conversations around food. We'll fight for the food sometimes, too. <laughs> <laughs> But like that's what that's what comes with West African food. It comes with culture, it comes with love. And that's the love and culture that I try to give individuals when they come to King Yeah. It's it's just incredible, uh Samad, just to hear your story. Because when I think about it for me is what you're doing is that you literally changing the narrative. You know about what it means to be African, but also like the values and uh, uh, that comes with the culture. You know, um, 
And you didn't do that through food, but now it's beyond. It's just also beyond food. It just has to do with your approach with people. Like I, I, I've seen you in setting outside of your restaurant, because I've been to your restaurant, and one thing I've noticed is like, your personality is consistent. You know, you. It's not a thing. It's, it's something I love mm-hmm. to do. Mm-hmm. Like honestly, like I said, I'm a foodie. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember, but I've seen you at other African restaurants mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because sometimes you understand. You know, you may come to my restaurant. I understand. Like you may get one thing from here, another thing from there, mm-hmm. and that's how I eat too. Mm-hmm. I eat because, like, that's like I was telling people. Like, they 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 may go to a restaurant. They try one thing. They be like, that their food ain't good. You know what I'm saying? You can't just turn somebody's reputation like that. Mm-hmm. You try one thing. Like you may not like the way they cook that beef. Like go with something simple at first, or go and like ask for some type of guidance that that restaurant is allowing you to. You know and I mean, if, if they're gonna speak with you. Mm-hmm. So like every single restaurant, it was like some of foodie I eat out mm-hmm. of until I find the best and I try to I, I try to get to it. But everybody makes something good. That they may not make this other product good, but they can have this product good. So like I said, you see me, you see me at various African restaurants, and I, I eat there. I go out and eat, like literally. Like people, are like, why don't you eat your, your restaurant? I mean, I have food. I can cook it. I create it. But I'm a foodie. I like to explore. I like different flavors. Like I like to, I mean, like I like to move around. So that's that's the answer to why like. I mean, I consistently eat at my restaurant, even though I got a restaurant. I like to support other people too. Because I know the blessings will come right back. You know what I'm saying? I gain knowledge. Um, I'm, able to, uh, I'm able to eat good. And also support. So that's the reason why like, you may always see me out eating at other cultural restaurants. It's, it's not, it's not big. I don't know why I feel like in Philly, they make, they make it such like a big problem. Like, yo, why are you eating here? Or like, you got a whole place. What's up with us in Philly doing that kind of stuff? Like, like, I stop that. Sometimes, people, sometimes I don't know. Some people get confused. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I will understand. I, I already understand a little bit. But I, I understand just slightly just from the mentality of how they may be thinking. But spread the love, man. Like, spread the love. Like, I go, I have, I have other friends that eat that have restaurants. I fly out there. I go eat there. Um, I shop them out. Like, it's enough love. Like, and it's like in the restaurant industry, there's enough money to be made, enough people to feed. That's all the stuff people like. If you look at a normal block, that's like say two block radius. Every household will have about two to three people there. So if every household has about two to three people there, right? How many houses on the block? I have this on the left side. Mm-hmm. How many houses you think? Probably like about seven, fifty. Fifty. About about fifty, right? Yeah. Let's say let's say about let's say about twenty five, right? This is fantastic. So on, on one left side, twenty five times two people in the household. That's fifty. Fifty times two sides of the block. This is one block. Mm-hmm. That's two. That's of course. I mean, like you got a hundred. So let's say you got a hundred people on one block, and that's only having a two family household. Mm-hmm. Well, if you know that we all live in neighborhoods in Philly where there's more than people in the family household. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If that hundred people come to your restaurant every single day, mm-hmm. you won't be able to tell. I mean, like for a small business, if, if, if you just start in that hundred, or let's say it's two, three hundred people, that's only one block. Mm-hmm. One block. Mm-hmm. And you got, let's say you have a whole two block. Mm-hmm. And there's like thousands of blocks in Philly, you feel me? Mm-hmm. Like hundreds of blocks in Philly. You won't be able to feed them. There's enough money to go around. This is there's enough people to feed. Everybody eats different food every single day. Mm-hmm. Right? So but people in their mind they think about they think about it too much and think, oh, I'm still in color. Like they, they like it's like it's, you gotta relax, man. Relax. Do what you need to do. Yeah. And somebody's gonna come to your place once a month, that's what that's what they do. Mm-hmm. If they come there twice a week, that's what they do. Mm-hmm. Like people are gonna create a custom to how they eat and where they eat. It's an amazing thing after you think about it, like, yo, I really get to have 200 people come per day in my restaurant and say, I want to eat. And guess what? There's going to be 200 people that's going to come to cook it. There's going to be 500 people that's going to cook it. There's going to be, like, people that go live and think, you know, go to there. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's going to be different places. You know, like, people are going to always, like, find their way to get somewhere. So, like, just relax. 
just like based on everything you shared with us, it's about recognizing the power of the coach. And I think that what's so uh, great about your story is that you were you were able to really uh, recognize this power at a very early age of your life. You know, some of us, you know, like you know, us. What I'm saying here, Toby, you, myself, Aki. You know, we sort of like we African, but we sort of grew up in this country. And sometimes there's this like moment where you like either you embrace the culture or you distance yourself from the culture. And then some people like uh, right now, I just feel like with the pickup of Afrobeat and everything, not everybody wants to hop yeah, on. Even like, that, you got to understand, right? So, I'm, I'm gonna go. I'm, mm-hmm. gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tap off on that point. Mm-hmm. So when I came up with the name Kings and Queens, right? Mm-hmm. This was like I started the restaurant at the age of twenty, around twenty three. That's when I started. Like, I'm twenty. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm thirty now. Mm-hmm. Like I started the age of the, the, the I started the restaurant at the age of twenty three. I went to school was not popular. Mm-hmm. Nothing. I'm saying it was literally like it was just African to try African. But not even that. But it's all these stereotypes about African. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, it, it, it was. I think it was like a lot of. I remember. It was one kid, man. I, I always remember this, even though like you know what I'm saying, it didn't, it, it, it didn't do anything to me or whatever it is, but he had looked at like a prominent oil suit and like, like cool. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't even try that, but on today today, this kid's the biggest eater of African food ever. And like literally. Because like you you gotta when you look at something, that's that's why I said tell people like presentation is key too, that's what we brought to the table. But you you gotta present Things to people where it makes it diverse. Mm-hmm. You can't be stuck in your ways of, oh, this is the way we do it, this is how we do it, whatever it is. You want people to grow, you want Russians, you want people from Sweden, you want people from Paris. I don't know, but I don't know about people from Russia. <laughs> that's, that, 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 that's a whole different conversation, but go ahead. <laughs> but, like, you, you want just different, like, cultures to try the West African culture. So that's how I went from the Kings and Queens. I made it something that it's not Samir's restaurant, it's not uh, Mankudu or Fatu's or whatever it is. Because it's like, I want everybody to have a place when it comes to like, we're all Kings and Queens within our own culture. It's diverse, it's unity. Yes. So that's why at that point, like before everybody started, oh, we Kings and Queens. Yeah, that's, that's, like, that's, that's what we try to do here too. Like, you know, one glove, copy one glove it, it, it's, shirt. It's one, but like, and I had a lot of but before everybody has, before everybody started that, mm-hmm. it, it was the Kings and Queens. I, I named it Kings and Queens because I believe that that time was coming when we're all kind of unified within one and understand that no matter what our color is, our race, um, we're all Kings and Queens within ourselves. Okay, that's a closing question. And I just want to touch on the business aspect of it a little bit. So, you know, restaurants, it's a cool business, you know. It's really hard, you know. They say most restaurants close or even start within five years. So you made seven for a year running. Um, yeah. You made it through the year of the pandemic. Hopefully it will end this year. Um, just in terms of, you know, the challenges facing restaurants in general before the pandemic was halted. What do you think was the toughest times um, in this process and what got you through it? The toughest time, like I said, is, is the business aspect, right? You have to know the business. No matter what industry you're in, whether you're doing the hair, you're doing hair, you're doing nails, you, um, you have a service, um, you do that well, like, you have to know the business side in order to scale. So the toughest time was just kind of what I'm doing, what I've been doing, is kind of being innovative and putting things. I'm, I got like some crazy things about to come up, man. But everybody watch, watch. We got some crazy things about to come up when it comes to kings and queens and ownership and how to kind of take control of your ownership past the restaurant industry. So that's what I'm really want. I mean, that's why I really want everybody to just kind of think about just kind of how to take ownership past whatever you're doing, how to kind of capitalize and move to the next step. Because we want the agriculture. You feel me? Like the, the 
the fighters that come in, like we want the agriculture from Africa, we want to get products from Africa, import, export, you know, mm-hmm. we, we, we want to be able to move the extreme mm-hmm. procurement. Like we, we, we really want to like just pass ourselves. It's really it's, it's better past the food, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but we're gonna see. Yeah. I'm excited, man. That sounds great. Um, it's awesome. So, like I said, we're closing out soon. Um, it's been great, uh, Samad. Just really thank you for sharing your experience with us. Um, thank you for being vulnerable. Thank you for sharing your skills. And, and I think we all, want, like I said, I've known you, but based on what you shared with me today, I learned so much about you. So thank you for coming up here to do that. We, we, we always ask this questions. If you could uh, look at, you know, go back and think of like a 10 year old version of yourself sitting in front of you right now, what advice would you give to him based on where you're at right now? I'm a bad ass 10 year old. <laughs> but, um, my advice would be like, believe in yourself, have confidence. And it's like every obstacle, know that it's not to always rip you down, but it's to build you. Cool. Um, I'm, 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 I'm going to close the shop. I'm going to let Toby wants to do it again. No, I think we're good. Um, just, you know, if they give you your IG, um, they want to contact you or Kings and Queens restaurant. Gotcha. So basically, we are Kings and Queens Liberian Cuisine. Life is too short by the average food, eat, culture. Um, you can get, catch us on Instagram and Facebook at Kings, K I N G S A N D. Queens, Q-U-E-N-S, man, uh, Cuisine, C-U-I-S-I-N-E, I'm sorry, that's Kings and Queens LC, not Cuisine, so Kings and Queens LC, that's on Facebook and Instagram, um, catch us on there, uh, check out our YouTube channel, we got a bunch of content on there, we got more content coming, basically like, um, we have a lot of, a lot of community things coming too, a lot of giving backs, um, we just trying to spread the love, so follow us. A lot in tune, and see how you can play a part. I appreciate it. Oh yeah, this is the last thing I share. We uh, this is important too. Given that you you have a lot going on in your schedule, you just came back from the motherland, and you're still back here right now, and you're naming all this project. So, uh, what do you do to take care of yourself? What is some of your self care right now? What do you do to keep yourself like mentally like you know flowed and pop like okay? I'm a bully, bro. I eat. I okay. travel on you. That's that's your self care. Traveling. That's my. I mean that. That's why I feel. That's why I feel happy. Like I, I don't really do the clubs, clubs like that. Mm-hmm. That's not I want, but like I explore. I explore other cuisines. I explore other cultures. Um, as I try to figure out the way more and more ways to bring others to my culture. I explore other cultures. Booty. That's why like, I feel comfortable with telling people, hey, get out there and explore. Because I do it. That's what I do with my living. Man, we appreciate you. Appreciate Honestly, you. thanks for coming in. And I hope you enjoy uh, being part of the Indeed, conversation man. with us today. Yeah. Kill the cup of soup. Yeah. yeah. Shout, shout out to Aki. Credit goes to Aki. Shout out to Yeah, we, I think we good. Yeah, we should. Yeah, yeah life is too short for average food. Eat culture. God bless. All right. That's it. That's it.